I'm camping for a few days at Big Ridge State Park in East Tennessee. This campground is located on an inlet of Norris Lake, which is famous for the Norris Dam. The dam is located on the Clinch River and provides hydroelectricity for the entire region. Standing here, it's hard to imagine that in 1942, the U.S. government commandeered 60,000 acres from nearby farming communities between Black Oak Ridge and the Clinch River to build the largest top secret facility of the Manhattan Project. My name is Natasha Bajma, and these are my dogs, Charlie and Luna. We're embarking on the adventure of a lifetime, a 365 day journey across America with my Ford 350 Super Duty pickup truck and a truck camper. But this is no ordinary road trip. This is what happens when a disillusioned nuclear weapons expert going through a midlife crisis, tries to begin a new career, but can't quite get off topic. Radioactive Road Tripping is a travelogue show that documents my transformation from a longtime national security expert to a newbie director, cinematographer, and producer. Today I'm going to take you on a drive through the area designated as Clinton Engineering Works during World War II, which was also known as the Secret City. The border of the Secret City starts about one mile after we pass by the Marathon gas station on the right. In 1943, we would have to stop at a military checkpoint known as Elsa Gate, which is now commemorated by Elsa Gate Park. Today we're going to visit the former K-25 gas diffusion plant and hear from local expert Ray Smith about the history of the region and the facilities that were built here. The drive from one end of the secret city to K-25, which is located near the west end border of the secret city, is about 15 miles long. Now remember, this 60,000 square foot area was completely cut off from public access until 1949. The collection of facilities at Oak Ridge manufactured the uranium material needed for the first nuclear weapon and went on to become a major component of the U.S. nuclear weapons complex and is currently in operation today. This is the place where they took mined uranium, which contains only a small amount of the isotope uranium-235 or U-235 needed for an explosion and turned it into uranium that could be used for a nuclear weapon with a process called enrichment. As we drive through this picturesque region, we'll hear Ray Smith talk about the history. So this area now known as Oak Ridge was prior to 1942, an area that was a small farming communities, many little communities like this one called Wheat and others, uh, New Hope community, Robertsville community. They had been here since the late 1700s, some of the families had. But in 1942, all at once, the property was needed, some 60,000 acres needed for the Manhattan Project and some 3,000 people had to leave their property, some of them in a matter of days, in order to make room for the Manhattan Project. So after those people were removed, almost immediately, construction began on three large sites uh, here in the Clinch River Valley. This area is bordered by the river on three sides, the east, the west, and the south. And they built the city along Black Oak Ridge, which is to the north of the government facilities. Uh, they called it Oak Ridge just because it's built on Black Oak Ridge. But the three sites, one of them was the graphite reactor, which was built to prove you could produce plutonium in a uranium reactor. Another one was the Y-12 electromagnetic separation plant, which was one that Ernest Lawrence had convinced General Groves would be the best method for, for separating this uranium-235 from 238. In natural ore, there's only seven pounds of uranium-235 in a thousand pounds of the ore. So getting that little bit of 235 out was what the goal was for that separation plant. Now, in addition to that, there was a process called gaseous diffusion that they were working on that would also enrich their uranium-235. It was a gaseous process and a continuous process. 
but they didn't have it working as well in the early stages. However, the electromagnetic separation process over in the Bear Creek Valley at Y-12 did work, but it was very, very slow. Now, an additional process was built over at the K-25 gaseous diffusion site, the S-50 thermal diffusion. Now, it was built because they needed something that that would add to the feed material to try and get it to run faster, to get that little bit, seven tenths of a percent, up to one, two, or three percent, and then feed that into the equipment that is the gaseous diffusion or the equipment over in Y-12 that was the electromagnetic separation process. So the thermal diffusion was built very quickly and was utilized for just a few months. But they actually calculate that by using that process, they shortened the war by about three weeks, which a lot of people were being killed back then. So that amount of time was important. But there were three main sites here built in Oak Ridge at what was called the Clinton Engineer Works. Built in about 18 months, think about that. Short period of time, major construction efforts, building a city that turned out to be 75,000 people living in it by August of 1945, and three main sites to help win the war. So the main purpose for the Manhattan Project was to take that uranium-235 and get enough of that material separated that you could put it into a bomb configuration. Uh, this one that is near us here is the Little Boy, a model of the Little Boy, which was the first bomb uh, ever used in warfare. And it was known to work. I mean, they just knew that if you got enough of that 235 in a close enough proximity, the neutrons would begin splitting the atoms and you would have a huge release of energy. That was understood. So this bomb was used without ever being tested because they had a little dynamite, I'm sorry, a little uranium here, a little uranium here, and a little dynamite to blow them together. It was a gun barrel, very simple process. However, the other bomb, the Fat Man bomb, which was a plutonium-based bomb, was not nearly as straightforward or convinced that it would work. The, it, the reason it was so complicated is that there was a sphere of plutonium in the center of 32 implosion cells that would compress that plutonium and put it in a critical shape so that it would begin to split the atoms and release huge energy. But if even one of those 32 implosions didn't go off at the same time, you would have a blowout. It wouldn't compress the plutonium. So that's why they had to have a test of it in uh, Alamogordo, New Mexico at the Trinity site where the first world's first atomic explosion took place when they tested to see if all 32 of those implosions would actually compress that plutonium and cause a criticality. It did on July the 16th, 1945. So they knew now they had a plutonium bomb that would work, Fat Man, and they were convinced that they had the little boy that without testing, they felt sure would work. So the little boy was used first on August the 6th on uh, Hiroshima, uh, and then Fat Man was exploded over Nagasaki on August the 9th. There's always this question about how this area was chosen for the Manhattan Project. Of course, the Norris Dam is about 20 miles upstream on the Clinch River, first dam built by the Tennessee Valley Authority, and that's a source of electricity. It's inland from the sea, and there are ridges and valleys that are located in this part of East Tennessee where you can put the plants down in the valleys and, and sort of protect them by the ridges. But what may be closer to the truth is when Albert Einstein wrote that letter to President Roosevelt saying Germany's buying up all this uranium ore and he was afraid they were trying to build a bomb out of it, Roosevelt knew it would be an expensive undertaking. So he put General Groves in charge of the Manhattan Project. Now Groves had just finished building the Pentagon, so he knew how to put a large construction project together. He knew how to get private industry involved, <laughs> and he knew how to spend money. So President Roosevelt also called in Senator McKellar, 
And he said, Senator, I need to put a large amount of money against the war effort, and I can't let the press or anyone know how much it is or what it's being used for. Can you help me with that? <laughs> Senator McKellar said, yes, Mr. President, I can do that for you. Just where in Tennessee are you gonna put that thing? <laughs> so that may have had more to do with us getting selected here in East Tennessee than any rivers and valleys and ridges and proximity to a dam. Uh, another Senator McKellar story that I know is true because the man that it happened to has just passed away within the past few months, Lester Fox. He's the patriarch, or was the patriarch of the Fox automobile dealerships in this area of East Tennessee. But in 1942, he was a sophomore in high school at Oliver Springs, a little community just north of here. And he was skipping school. Him and his buddy were playing the pinball machine. Now, when they got through, they were walking down the main street of the little town. They walked by the telephone office. Telephone operator named her head out and said, Lester, go get the principal. He's got an important phone call. Now, Lester's skipping school, but he does. He goes and gets the principal. Principal comes over and takes the phone call, comes back to the school, calls all the students together in an assembly, and says, I've just gotten a phone call from Senator McKellar. He wants me to tell you to go home and tell your parents you're going to have to find another place to live. The government's going to take your property for the war effort. Now, Lester swears that's the way these 3,000 people first learned they were going to have to get off of 60,000 acres in order to make room for the Manhattan Project. Now, many of them didn't have automobiles. They didn't have trucks to move their belongings. If they had a car, they might not be able to buy gas for it or tires. Those things were rationed. But what they did have is young men in the military getting killed. So they wanted to do anything they could to stop that killing and end the war. So they got off of their property, many of them in a matter of days, in order to make room for the Manhattan Project. We've just passed through the center of Oak Ridge and are now driving the second half of what used to be the Clinton Engineering District to reach the former K-25 plant. I mentioned before that this entire area was closed off and inaccessible to the public during World War II. In 1949, the U.S. government opened the commercial and residential areas of Oak Ridge to allow for public access. They replaced the military checkpoints and fences with three access gatehouses to prevent unauthorized individuals from visiting the sensitive areas. The first gatehouse at Bear Creek Road served as an access control to the Y-12 production plant, Bethel Valley Road was for the X-10 graphite reactor, and Oak Ridge Turnpike was for the K-25 plant. These gatehouses were used until 1953 and are now considered historic sites. We're about to drive by the Oak Ridge Turnpike Gatehouse, which controlled access to the K-25 plant. We just made the turn to the K-25 gaseous diffusion plant. Now, if you remember, this plant wasn't used during the Manhattan Project, but later supported the development of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Today, it is no longer in operation. So we're here today in the K-25 History Center, which was built in uh, February, opened in February of 2020, our most recent museum here in Oak Ridge. And it's to tell the story of the K-25 gaseous diffusion plant. The world's largest building at the time was the K-25 building. It was a mile long in a huge U-shape, and there were some 3,000 cells in that building that through, an electric, through the uh, gaseous diffusion process would, would actually enrich the uranium-235. And by December of 1945, I'm sorry, 1946, it was capable of enriching it to weapons grade. 
And at that point, the K25 gaseous diffusion process became the process that was used to enrich all of the nation's highly enriched uranium that we have today. And that material is what was used in all of the nuclear weapons that we built during the Cold War. After the uh, war ended and the gaseous diffusion process became capable of providing the uranium, then the Y-12 plant, the Kaeatrons, were shut down, all of them except two buildings, and they were removed. So there were a lot of empty space, a lot of empty buildings there at Y-12. Two things happened. One, they went out to Los Alamos and brought back the technology for creating metal, uranium metal, out of the powder that had been sent out there by Y-12. So now the production of nuclear weapons secondaries has taken place up until today at the Y-12 plant. It's the nation's center of excellence for uranium processing. Another thing that happened is some of the buildings were used for biology complex of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And other things that have taken place over the years, like fusion research energy, has taken place there. And some of those buildings that were uh, originally used for the two stages of the calutrons, alphas and betas. And all of those buildings have been used over the years for those kinds of very high technolo technological experience and experiments that have been used to help advance science, especially in the energy research area. But Y-12 continues today to be the nation's uh, production facility for the secondaries of nuclear weapons. It also stores all of the nation's highly enriched uranium that's not in a nuclear weapon, in a research reactor, or in the Navy's reactors on their submarines and their ships. And that's a wrap for our driving tour of the secret city of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. A huge thank you to Ray Smith for meeting me at three of Oak Ridge's museums and sharing his knowledge of the unique history of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. If you want to follow my journey, please remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you'd like to have access to behind the scenes content and exclusive merchandise, become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Natasha Bajama 